Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Vine Church. This is our digital service for February 6th. Thanks for joining us. Today is our final sermon in our Wisdom Sermon Series. Uh, all of those are available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. This has been a great way to start off the new year. How do we draw closer to God? How do we get inspired by his wisdom in scripture and live it out in our lives? We meet in person every Sunday at 1030 a.m. at 3950 Leonard Street in Grand Rapids. We invite you to join us. We have COVID safety protocols in place uh, in our nursery, in our children's church areas, and uh, in the area that we worship, and we wear a mask throughout the service. Please join us every Sunday at 1030 a.m. We hope to see you there.
Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. 
His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Hello, thank you for joining us at The Vine today for worship. I'm Pastor Jim Richter, and it's so great to be with you. I'd love to connect with you. Um, send me an email at pastorjim at onthevinechurch.com, and we can converse via email or phone call or get together for a cup of coffee. I just would love to get to know you, hear your prayer requests, pray for you, see if you have any questions about The Vine. Um, just would love to get together. Also wanted to let you know about the new series coming up. Today's the last sermon in the series, Wisdom for the Wise. And next week, we're going to roll over into a new series called Confusion to Confidence. We live in a world right now where there's so much confusion. People seem to be wandering around and looking for hope. And that's exactly what God gives us through the cross and empty tomb of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're going to be exploring some of the big questions. Is there a purpose to life? Is there a God that I can trust? Can I trust the Bible? Is Jesus really the way to God? We're going to study those basic questions through the lens of Jesus' cross and empty tomb. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, the season of Lent. Uh, actually refers to the lengthening of days, but it's a special time in the church where we really focus on Jesus' death and resurrection for us and time of great spiritual renewal, we'd invite you to step into a time of spiritual renewal. 49 days, not just 40, but 49. And for us, we're going to do 777, seven days a week. Um, I'm going to put out seven minute videos and um, for the for the seven weeks um, leading up to celebrating Easter. And We'd invite you to be part of that. Those videos are just going to be seven minutes. They're going to be posted on Facebook. I'm also going to have them printed out for people that don't have access to that. Um, and would love to you to stick with us for all seven messages during that time too. Just really um, being part of that spiritual renewal. And then we have a Zoom Bible study on Wednesday nights uh, at 8 p.m. And you're all invited to that as well. We want to move right into our, our scripture today and our message. Um, it is wisdom for hot topics and our witness. Um, and so it's a relevant message for us, but I want to pray for you, uh, pray for the needs of our nation, and uh, pray for the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds for that message. So please pray with me. Dear Gracious Father, so grateful to be gathered together for worship and to just gather around you, Jesus, and your word. And so we pray that you'd bless this time. God, you told us where two or three are gathered. There are you in our midst. And so we believe that and we believe you are going to show up by the power of your spirit and open scripture and open our hearts and give us faith and guidance for life. And so thank you, Jesus. Um, Lord, we pray also for those who are watching uh, the, the worship today, worshiping with us, that you'd be with each one. Lord, every single one of your children has different questions or different struggles. And Lord, you know exactly what each one is. So you are Savior. You are Lord. Reach out and touch, heal, deliver, guide as only you're able to, Jesus. You're our living Savior, and so we trust you. Lord, we pray for our nation. Um, Lord, we have so many concerns, but we know that you sit on your throne and you rule over all the nations and all the kings of the earth. And so, Lord, we pray that your will would be done and your kingdom would come, that you would reign over this nation in righteousness, that you'd raise up godly people that speak the truth in love, and Lord, that you would um, uh, make a way for peace so that the good news can continue to go forth and people can continue to be saved. Lord, we know that you're preparing us all and this earth for your coming. So we pray, come Lord Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text today for this message, Wisdom for Hot Topics and um, Your Witness, is 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 27. We've been walking through the book of Corinthians. 
um, on looking at this topic of wisdom, we learned at 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Christ has become for all of us believers wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. And we've been tracking through the book and, and seeing how God's wisdom is different than what the world thinks is smart. As a matter of fact, what the world thinks is smart is often foolish to God. And what the world thinks is foolish is God's wisdom. The world thinks Jesus' cross is foolish. But that's God's wisdom and salvation for you and me. The world thinks it's foolish that, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but it's absolutely true. That's why the church exists today by the billions. Um, and so today we want to continue that topic of wisdom. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 27. This is actually part of a larger section that runs from 1 Corinthians 8 to 1 Corinthians 11, really verse 1, where Paul sums it up today. Um, Paul here is facing criticism. People are asking the question of Paul, Paul, whose side are you on? Are you a Jew? Or are you really for the Greeks, those, those un, uncircumcised Gentiles? Or are you for the church of God? Who are you really for? In this section, Paul is given a reason why he doesn't get paid by any of the local people he's serving for his missionary work. Doesn't get paid by the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God. Because Paul wants to make sure people know he works for God. He wants to make sure that he doesn't have to serve any human being. He can only serve those people. He can just focus on serving the people that he is seeking to share Jesus with. Nobody controls Paul. Only Jesus Christ is his Lord. He doesn't work for the synagogue or the church or culture. He works for God. Now we'll pick up with that thought in our text. If you have your Bibles, open them to 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul says, For I preach the gospel, that, give, that gives me no grounds for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel, as a servant of the gospel, he could have asked uh, for people to pay him, but he didn't. He did it free of charge. For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I may win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I may win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, left, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be dis disqualified. So today, again, wisdom for hot topics and your witness. And this text speaks right to both. How do we, how do we handle all these hot topics around us and at the same time keep our Christian Christ-centered witness. 
So we face all around us hot topics. They are swirling in our day, aren't they? There's topics like race and gender and gun control and class, sexuality, creation, religion, salvation, heaven, hell, Jesus, the Bible. These hot topics go on and on, and they're all around us. How do we handle those? We see how different people and culture handle them. Some of them come off as brash and strong and stand up for what is righteous and good, and, and that, that's good. But in some ways... People that aren't Christians are being felt like they're being forced into biblical Christian morality. And so it's causing them to push back from believers and the witness of the good news about Jesus Christ. I think if we were doing this right, people would see Jesus. Now I'm going to bring up like what we see when we see Jesus. And you tell me if this is what people think of, who, what you think people think of who aren't Christians, okay? Sometimes we'll call them the far left or whatever. You, you know, I, hate, I hate labeling people like that, but you know what I mean. Does the far left think evangelicals or evangelical Christians are this? Do they really see Jesus in them? Do they see humility? Our humble Savior, born in a manger. Do they see love in that force? Do they see grace in that judgment? Do they see truth in that silence or acquiescence or, or lies? Do they see truth? Do they see gentleness and not harshness? Do they see respect, not disgust? Do they see steadfastness, like people that are going to hang in there and persist and not give up on them? Or do they see people that are kind of sticking their nose up in the air and staying on their own side of the street? Do they see someone who wants to be a friend with them? Or do they see someone that's just going through the motions because they have to be obedient to God or because they feel obligated? Do they see someone who really wants to be a friend? See, see all these things would be attributes of Christ and actually guidance from scriptures about our witness, humility and love and grace and truth and gentleness and respect and steadfastness and friendship. But is that what people who need Jesus in our world are seeing from God's people? Well, today we get wisdom from Paul so that we might reflect Jesus more fully. The hot topic that Paul is discussing in our text, and actually at 1 Corinthians 8 through 11, 1, is about food sacrificed to idols. Now, in Corinth, you could hardly go to the market and buy meat without really believing it probably had been sacrificed to idols. You didn't know for sure. And Paul's facing criticism. People are asking Paul, like, whose side are you on? What's your view about this, Paul? Are you like the Jews? They, they say you can't, cannot buy meat from the market. Are you like the Greeks who say you can buy anything you want and eat it? Are you like the church that says Jesus set us free? We're free. We're not saved by what we eat. We're saved by Jesus who lived perfect and died for our sins on the cross. And he's the one that makes us clean. Eating food doesn't make us clean or unclean. So where are you, Paul? And so Paul speaks to that in our text today. And 
The first thing that Paul wants us to look at as we as we look at this is is to think about what what is the goal and what should our strategy be? As Paul gets these questions, he doesn't pick any side. Instead, he he thinks kind of teaches more about how we should handle these hot topics and at the same time, be a witness. So Paul would direct us back towards what is the goal and what is the strategy. So in our life, in this world, what is the goal? Is it to, for a Christian, to legislate morality? Is it to get the Ten Commandments posted in the public square again? Is it get to get prayer back in public school? Is, to, is, is it to save our nation for our kids? Is it to force the conversion of people? So, so I would give thanks to God if we had a society with all these back in place. But is that the ultimate goal for God's people? And Paul would return us back to the ultimate goal. You see, Paul was living in an incredibly pluralistic society, in a sinful society. If you remember, this is Corinth. It is incredibly immoral. There's sexual immorality. There's greed that would make the worst business person on Wall Street, Wall Street blush. There's slavery and abuse in slavery. There's crazy abuse of power. There's crushing taxation. There's, for Christians in that age, economic hardship, confiscation of property, persecution, and loss of life. That's what Christians were facing. They were facing accusations like cannibalism because of, you know, eating Jesus' body and blood in the Lord's Supper and that being misunderstood by the public around them. They were facing charges of incest because they called their brothers and sisters in Christ brothers and sisters. And they even married them sometimes. Totally misunderstood. They, they were called atheists in their culture because they did not bow their head to Caesar. And so all this is going on. And, and the question is, Paul, should we push back? Should we stop the sale of this meat sacrifice to idols? Should we take up our sword? Should we um, go to, to the, the city leaders and tell them why they just can't have meat in the market that's that's sacrificed to idols, or some have to have signs on that's been sacrificed to idols, or some don't. Shouldn't we do that, Paul? And Paul would say to the people of God in Corinth and to us, what's the goal? What's the goal? Get back to your goal, your ultimate goal. Genuinely love people so that they are saved. Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 8, this section, saying, Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We, guys, we know um, what the Bible teaches about clean and unclean food and all that. The Jew knows that. You know, the Gentile knows that. that we're not saved by what we eat, by, by Jesus Jews and Gentiles have all this knowledge, but just knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Do you, do you love God? God loves you. God so loved you that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die for your sins and rise in victory for you. He loves you when you're bad and he loves you when you're good. He never stops loving you. 
He loves all the people around us as well. See, knowledge puffs up. We can tear people down around us who just don't have the knowledge that we have about God and His holiness and the glorious commandments He's given us and the beauty of His love for us in Christ and His forgiveness and that He's cleansed us and set us free to live for His glory. We have that knowledge, but there's people all around us that don't have it yet. And they need to know that God loves them. And so our goal is to love people so that they're saved. Paul says in this section in our text, and it's kind of the main point today, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. God calls us to genuinely love people so that they are saved. Our, our goal is not just to be right. Our goal is to honor God and be right, but our goal is to love people so that they know Jesus, so that they can be born again and live by the law of the Spirit of God so that they long to please God because they love Him. And so that is our goal. What is our strategy? Our strategy, Paul lays out in our text in, and uh, the rest of this section, 1 Corinthians 8 through 11, 1, and it's to imitate Christ, to identify with Christ, and to invite people to relate to Christ. So, first of all, what does it mean that our strategy is to imitate Christ? Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11, 1. It's kind of the summary of this whole section. And I, I really think we need to go here first so that we can see what Paul is, is trying to call us to in terms of the strategy of helping love people so that they're saved. So whether you eat or whether you, or whatever you do, or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean to imitate Christ? so that people are saved. What? Think about Jesus. What, what did he do? Well, he left his throne in heaven to come down to save you and me. He came to a dirty stable in Bethlehem. He, he was born to peasants and he lived with them and grew up in a village with real people. And then he, he, he walked on dusty roads, dirty roads, and he reached out and touched untouchables. Lepers. Nobody touched a leper. That would make you unclean. But it didn't make Jesus unclean. Jesus was clean, and he made the unclean clean. It didn't go the other way. He did incredible miracles by the power of God. He taught like no one else ever taught the Word of God. And then... He died for our sins and rose in victory. The Bible says that Jesus was focused on saving the lost. Luke 19, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Mark 2, 17, Jesus says, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 8, 12. 
We see Jesus, the good shepherd who leads the 99 to find one that's wandered off. What does it mean to imitate Christ so that people are saved? It means to be humble, not prideful. It means to be love, not to force people into a relationship with God or to do what God says to do, but to help them know God loves them and longs for a relationship with them. It means to be grace, not judgment, not cast stones at those who are caught in sin. It means to be truthful, always, never silent when um, there's an opportunity to share the truth, but to do it in genuine love, to be gentle, not harsh, to do it with respect, not disgust, to be steadfast, to love and not give up. That's what Jesus did all the way to the cross. Even when he hung on the cross, he could have come down. When he was suffering horribly, he could have come down. But love held him there. There's a, a spot in Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, where Jesus is, is being attacked because because he's not doing what people say he should do. As a matter of fact, he's not doing what the religious people, the Jews, his own people say he should do. And they say these words, and uh, I'll just put up a portion of it. The Son of Man, Jesus said, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunk and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Jesus was accused. He was accused of being a friend of sinners. Are you accused of that? If we imitate Christ, that accusation is going to come our way sometimes. We don't want to condone any sin. But Jesus was able to be with people and be loving and be respectful and be gentle and be truthful. And they received him. And God calls us to imitate Jesus. I, I love the way that Eugene Peterson translates John 1.14. The word, Jesus, God from eternity, became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. That was Jesus. And God calls us to imitate him in this text. That's how we are in this world and we handle hot topics and at the same time give a witness. God also calls us to not just imitate Christ, but to identify with Christ. <laughs> what does that mean? Identify with Christ. Well, in our culture, that identity word is becoming a big deal, isn't it? Um, you know, uh, people are kind of wondering what their identity is. People are choosing what their identity is. People have identities when it comes to, um, you know, uh, the world, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. Um, uh, you, you, you can list a hundred other labels. People have identities. But here, God calls us to identify 
with Christ. Remember the accusations that Paul was facing. Like they're asking, like, Paul, whose side are you on when it comes to this um, eating meat thing? Are you on the Jews' side or the Gentile side or the church's side? And Paul's like, I'm on Jesus' side. I'm on the side of Christ. See, Paul is free. He's not getting paid by any of them. He's working for God. And he's doing his tent-making ministry on the side. But nobody can say, Paul, you're supposed to be working for us. No, Paul's working for God. And so Paul is free from all but the lordship of Christ. So he can relate to all. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for, for me. Is that your identity? That you are in Christ? That, um, that you know, all that other identity stuff died? But all your, your value, all of who you are and want to be is Christ. The one who lived for you and died for your sins and rose in victory, and now lives in you. Is that your identity? Paul calls us to identify with Christ. I'm going to read the section, 1 Corinthians 19, uh, or 9, 19 through 23. You can follow along in your Bible. I, I just put the last two verses up for you. But Paul writes, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak, I become all things to all people that all, by all means I might win some, save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them its blessings, that they might be saved. <laughs> God calls you to be in Christ, to identify with Christ. His humility and His love, His grace, His truth, His gentleness, His respect, His steadfastness, His friendship. If we identify with Christ, if we just seek to be Jesus to people, not any other label, if Divine Church seeks to be Jesus to people, not any other label, not Jew, not Gentile, not the church of God, whatever label that is on the outside of it, but Jesus to people, how do you think they'll respond? I think, I think they'll respond like they did to Jesus by the thousands. And that brings us to our last point in the strategy, invite people to relate to Christ. Paul writes in, uh, again, summarizing 1 Corinthians 10, 32 through 11, 1. This is the end of this section. He says, Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Again, that grand um, goal. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And, and, and right here, I want you to focus on that word, follow. I think sometimes we um, are more about convincing people that we're right 
than introducing them to our best friend, Jesus, and letting him do the heavy lifting. Jesus, when he called people, he had simple words, follow me, you know, relate to me, hang out with me. And he went and he hung out with people. And it was through that process that they were, you know, transformed. Their heart, their mind was opened through his love and his loving actions. And, and then as, as he taught, they, they did come to a place of repentance. They saw God. Their eyes were open, his holiness. And they just broke down and, and, and confessed their sins. And Jesus put his hand on them and raised them up with his forgiveness. And then their lives were transformed as they continued to follow and relate to him. Paul teaches us this in this text. He, he, Paul teaches us to direct all activities towards the goal of a person's salvation. He, he, he directs us to, to help someone see Jesus, experience Jesus, so that they're saved. Paul writes, don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. What Paul says is, I work intently for the salvation of a person. If, if I'm talking about a hot topic, like um, uh, in our culture, sexuality and, um, and how that is supposed to work, or marriage, I have in view my goal that that person is saved. And so uh, I know what's right. The Bible speaks clearly on sexuality, human sexuality, and marriage. It speaks so clearly. And I'm going to speak the truth in love. But my goal is that they're saved. And so I'm patient. I'm loving. I I wait for the conversation to come to me instead of preaching to them. I never compromise, but I'm always loving. And that's what Paul would teach us, to relate, but never compromise. We're inviting them again to relate to the person of the risen Christ who is always with us as we are sharing. I want to show you how this works. So in this section, in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 31, Paul really teaches us kind of an example of how this works with meat sacrificed to idols. But it also relates to what we're facing. Um, the Church of Corinth is crying out. We're not under the law anymore in this section. Jesus fulfilled the law. He, he, we, we're not saved by what we eat, clean meat. Um, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, and so they, they kind of, the church in Corinth would say, I'm made holy by Jesus so I can eat all the ham I want. Boy, the Jew would gasp at that. I can worship on Sunday instead of Saturday or whatever day. I, I don't have to get circumcised with, you know, if they're a Gentile in the church in Corinth. I don't have to keep the Passover if I don't want to. Keeping the law is not going to save me. Jesus saves me. Um, for you and me, uh, for you and me, it might be I'm free. I can vote whichever way I want. I, you know, Jesus wasn't a Republican or a Democrat. I can vote whatever I want. I can, I can eat food packaged or use some other product produced by a company that, that is all out for abortion or gay or lesbian or transgender or questioning or, or whatever if I want. I'm not saved if I boycott them or if, 
if, if, if I do or don't. It's not what saves me. I'm free. And so Paul's going to address this. How, hot topics. How do we handle this? Listen to what Paul says in this section. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. It's not love. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. It's not going to lead to the goal of the salvation of an individual. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Paul says, go ahead, eat in the meat market. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising a question of conscience. It was probably bought at the meat market, probably sacrificed to an uncle. Don't worry about it. Don't make it the center of your conversation. This is a hot topic, but you don't need to go there unless. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours, because you don't have to worry about meat sacrifice to idols. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I gave thanks to God for? But if that other person who is an unbeliever, tells you it was sacrificed to idols, though this is my view on this, then you need to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat that. Because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And um, I, don't, I don't worship any other idol but the one true God. I love him so much. He's so great. He loves me. He, he came to this earth to save me. He did these incredible miracles. He taught like nobody else. And then he died for my sins so I can be with God forever. And he loves me and he's with me right now. And that's what you say. And Paul says, so whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God, for the salvation of that person. Paul calls us and he says, I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Our goal, Jesus is living. Jesus is risen. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is our Savior and he is Lord over heaven and earth and he is working every day, all day to bring our friends, our family, our neighbors, our co-workers to faith in him. And we get to represent him. That's how he designed it. It's the way the gospel comes to people. It's the way people are saved. We get to be part of doing this eternal work as we imitate Christ, as we identify with Christ and Christ alone, and as we invite people to relate to him. Come follow him. Come follow him. That's what I'm doing. I'm following him. I'm on a journey. I'm so not perfect. But he is. And he forgives and he loves and I'm growing. I'm growing to be more and more like him every day as I imitate and follow him. I invite you to pray with me. Father, thank you. Lord, it is so hard to live in this world. And Lord, to... Um, you know, give good witness of your grace and your truth in Scripture when it comes to hot topics and good witness to those around us who don't know Jesus. It's hard, Lord. And you knew that. That's why you promised to send us the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, to be with us and in us. And so, God, we need your help. Walk with us. Help us to imitate you, Jesus, to walk like you walked. Help us to identify with you before other people, to simply just point to you, our Savior, and reflect you in our actions. And Lord, help us to invite people to join us in following you and growing with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us at The Vine today. I hope I get a chance to visit with you. You can email me again at pastorjim at onthevinechurch.com. 
God bless you.